الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه الطيبين الطاهرين The Book of Marriage and what is related to it of rules and judgments Marriage is recommended for whoever is in need of it So either you're going to be a man or a woman as for the case of the woman if she's in need of marriage then she just tells her guardian that I want to get married for example but for the case of the man it's more detailed because the man is the one who has to provide and support so it's not just as simple enough as wanting to get married as in the case of the woman he should for it to be recommended for him he should uh be able to afford it so not only does he need it but also he can afford it needed means has a sexual desire and he can afford it the woman doesn't have to afford it so it's enough for her just to need it as for who cannot afford it then it's not recommended for him and as for who does not need it then if he will busy himself with worship and knowledge then it's not recommended for him to get married but if he will not busy himself with worship and knowledge although he doesn't have a pressing need for marriage it would be recommended for him to do so so to help to occupy him for the woman is not a matter of her affording it rather she's going to have to be careful who she marries in the first place because she won't be able to get out easily So, when all the signs are there, take note of them and protect yourself sisters from getting into something that you can't get out of. Subhanallah. It is permissible for the freeman to marry four free women at once and for the slave to marry two. So, a man, if he's not a slave, he can have up to four wives at once and if he is a slave, he can have up to two wives at once as for the kafirs they said you can only have one wife but if you run around and just have premarital sex with many many women then you're the man if you have more than one wife according to them then uh, you're a scoundrel but if you have many women outside of marriage then you're the man that's the way they think because sure even among the kuffar the woman might say for example i don't want you to have another woman i mean from the perspective of their laws and from the perspective of their culture they didn't do anything in their laws to stop or dispraise a man from having many women outside of marriage but when it comes to marriage they stopped him a freeman does not marry a slave woman because his baby will be a slave his baby will be owned by the master so he cannot marry a slave woman except under two conditions not having the dowry of a free woman yani he can't afford to marry a free woman or what's like that is not being accepted by any of the free women add to that the fear of fornication that if he doesn't marry the slave woman then he will fornicate because he can't marry a free woman then he can uh, but not only should a person avoid marrying a slave woman because his baby will be born as a slave the scholars also said he should avoid marrying a slave woman because of the expectation of that slave woman being used It is not permissible to explicitly propose to a woman in her waiting period. Ever. It is never permissible to explicitly propose to a woman who's in her idda, which is for him to say to her, "I want to marry you," or for him to say to her, "Marry me," or "Be my wife," or something like that. Explicit proposal If a woman is in her idda that's haram that's haram it is permissible to hint to her 
if she's in an irrevocable idda, an idda that she can't be brought back out of, back into the marriage. She cannot be returned back to her husband. Like, she got divorced three times. And tell me, if you can, before the end of our session, what's another case when a woman cannot be brought back other than being divorced three times? If you know the answer, go ahead. See if you can give me the answer before the end of our session, inshallah. Uh, so if she's in an irrevocable idda, he, she cannot be brought back to the marriage, then it's permissible for him to hint that he wants to marry her and he cannot be explicit about it. Like to say to her, you are beautiful. Or to say to her, many men would like to marry you. And then he can marry her after her waiting period has expired. Why he cannot propose to her while she's in her idda? For fear that she would lie about her idda being over. So he cannot do that. To look for the sake of getting married, it is permissible for him to look at her face and hands. It is permissible for him to look at a marriageable woman without a need. As long as he doesn't look in a forbidden way. As long as he doesn't look in a forbidden way. But he can look at a marriageable woman without a need to do so. Like if he just looked at her without looking at her with desire. He, his eye fell upon her. If his eye falls upon her, he's not obligated to turn his eye away from her if he's not looking at something haram. If he's only seeing her face and her hands, then he's not obligated to turn his eyes away or his face from her. So we say that he can look at her without a need, as long as he's looking at her face and her hands without desire. If he's looking at any other part of her body, he cannot look even without desire. Even without desire, he can't look. And as for if she wears tight clothing, then what would be haram as far as his looking for him to admire her body, to admire the shape of her body through her clothing? That's haram if she's not his wife. So he should turn away. The second is for him to look at his wife and his slave woman. What's correct is that he can look at all of their bodies with no restriction. The third is for him to look at the bodies of his unmarriageable kin his non-marriageable female relatives, and his married slave woman. He has a slave woman who's married to someone. It is permissible to look at everything other than what is between the navel and the knees. His non-marriageable relatives, his mother, his sister, his daughter, his aunt, his niece. He can see all of their bodies except what's between their navel and their knees. That includes the breast, and it does not include the thigh, which is the reverse of what the non-Muslims accepted. They didn't accept for their non-marriageable kin to expose their breasts in front of them, but they did accept for their non-marriageable kin to expose their thighs. So she might be in the house just with shorts on, and you can see what's above her knee, you can see her thigh, for example. So that's not permissible. If he saw her breast, he would have a heart attack. Same thing for his married slave woman. So she's his slave woman, but she's married to another man. Then he can see all of her body except what's between her navel and her knees. And he cannot have sexual intercourse with her, of course, because she's married. To look for the sake of treatment, like he's a doctor... It is permissible for him to look at the spot that he needs to see. However, if that woman was able to be treated by her husband, then she does not bypass her husband because he is the most deserving of seeing her nakedness. And the last person who can see her nakedness in the list of all who can treat her is the pubescent, marriageable, kafir, Male with a penis. That's the last choice that she goes to when she needs to expose her aura for treatment.
However, she's allowed to go to the more proficient doctor. The marriage contract is not valid without a guardian and two trustworthy witnesses. According to the majority of the scholars, not according to Abu Hanifa, according to Abu Hanifa, the marriage contract is valid without a guardian, under conditions, not absolutely. The guardian and the two witnesses are in need of six conditions. Islam, so they cannot be kuffar. The witnesses can never be kuffar. Puberty, so they can't be children. Sanity, so they can't be crazy. Freedom, so they can't be slaves. Being male, so they can't be women. And trustworthiness, so they cannot be untrustworthy. So they can't be major sinners. Nor can they be people whose bad deeds outnumber their good deeds. All of that takes them out of trustworthiness. Nor can they be people who do not behave in accordance with the manners of the people of their status. So if those witnesses are statesmen, then they behave as the state, statesmen behave. If those witnesses are scholars, then they behave as the scholars behave. If those witnesses are laymen, they behave as the good laymen behave. This means when we say the people of their status, we mean the good ones of their status. That's the trustworthiness that has to exist in the witnesses. However, the guardian of the woman of the people of the book, the Jew or the Christian, does not have to be a Muslim for the validity of her marriage, meaning when the Muslim man marries a Jewish or Christian woman, her Jewish or Christian father can give her away, but under the condition that he's trustworthy in their standards. To the Jews and Christians, he's a good man then he can give her away. If not, then he can't give her away. And the slave woman's master does not have to be trustworthy. Also, trustworthiness is not a condition for the master to be able to give away his slave woman in marriage. Also, trustworthiness is not a condition for the caliph, the khalifa, to be able to give any woman away in marriage. The caliph he is the general guardian for everyone, all the Muslims. So included under the powers and duties of the Khalifa is the ability to give women away in marriage, even his own daughters, even if he's a major sinner. The most deserving to be guardians are the father, meaning she was born in wedlock, or else he's not the father. He's just a man that she was created from his semen, and he's not her father, and she does not inherit from him, and he cannot give her away in marriage. Then the grandfather, the father of the father, and all of her guardians have to be from the father's side. Then the full brother, then the half-brother from the father. Then the nephew from the full brother. Then the nephew from the half-brother. Then the uncle from the father. Then his son, which is her cousin. According to this, then if there were no agnates, yani those male relatives don't exist, then she goes to whoever set her free, if she was a slave woman previously. And if he's not there, then she goes to his male relatives from his father's side. And she goes through them one by one, like we just did. Then... If there's no such person, she goes to the ruler, like the judge or the caliph. If there's no one like that, like in our case, then she goes to a trustworthy, knowledgeable Muslim with her fiancé, and they appoint him to act as a judge in their marriage. They say to him, we now appoint you to act as a judge in our marriage. And then he says, I accept. As for what some women do, at least in my town, which is that she would be a convert like so many of us are, and then she wouldn't have a proper guardian. So then she goes to some brother and she says to him, can you be my wakil? Or she might say, can you be my wali? But the famous word that I hear in the streets is, can you be my wakil? And he says, yes, I'll be your wakil. And then... 
a lot of times what happens is he doesn't let anyone marry her because really he wants to marry her. But that's besides the point. He has no authority in this case. Like, what can he do if he's her wakia? What can he do? Can he give her away in marriage? He cannot. He's not her father. He's not her wali. So what he can do? He, can he tell her, you can't marry this guy? He can't. He can just help her. That's all. But he doesn't really have any authority. So let that be known. Like, he can talk to brothers for her if, he, if she needs to. Or something like that. Oh, 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 oh.